Anyway, let's um go ahead and Garrett. Well, there's Garrett. Hey, Garrett. Good morning. Good morning. Here, let me take let me take up two spaces, Garrett. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I apologize for a second. I usually okay. So today I'm gonna ask that uh get a motion that we um uh, approve the um uh, consent agenda as uh well we uh, approve the agenda as submitted in the packet you to approve okay gail second. and do we get a second second Sharon, thank you all in favor aye. aye aye opposed nay okay passes then i'd also like uh to have a motion to approve the consent agenda including the regular uh Meeting minutes, the current financial reports, statistical reports, donations report as submitted. Motion. I move to accept the consent agenda. Okay, and second, second, Garrett. Okay, thank you, Sharon Garrett. All, all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, no. Okay, those pass. Okay, uh, we'll jump right into uh, the public comment period. Do we have anyone? No, okay, I saw the a microphone being given to Ben over there, and I didn't know whether we had any. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, lack in public comment period. Let's jump right into report. Uh, looks like Clay, you're doing it for the uh, friends, right? I guess so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the the friends book sale, as you know, the last one was held on the 14th and fifteenth uh, uh, of this month. They raised a little over fourteen thousand dollars. They had a, a a good result there. There, um, we've asked them for a, a little more of their their space uh, that they're currently utilizing, a little more of the space back uh, here on the same on the mezzanine level. And um, in preparation for that, their next sale coming up on first Friday, they'll be uh, open for a half price sale from seven to nine. That's on. Uh, Friday, May 5th, and on the Saturday from uh, May 6th, from 10 to 4, they're having a bag sale. So you can get a bag full of all the books you can cram in it for $5, and teachers will be able to, to fill bags for $2. So they're trying to, they've got a, a surplus of, of books right now, and they're trying to lighten the load a little bit, but uh, very good uh, results on the on the sale, um, I think that's about it uh, uh, that I have for them. Uh, they're uh, bringing in uh, a couple new members, um, uh, but I think you all knew the uh, last two that they brought on board, but they're recruiting some, some others now. But um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Excellent, Clay. Thank you. Um, I might ask, how is the consolidation of space gone? The friends now has enough room and can can work, but we've reclaimed some of that for the um, uh, library, I mean, the law, business, and history, we're calling it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so we're, we're sort of through some of that and work in progress, and a lot of progress has been made up to this point. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, any questions, Clay? Susan, could we get you? Yes, good morning, everybody. I want to thank everyone who joined us for yesterday's Maya Smart event. Your presence and support was appreciated and noted by attendees. Gazala Hashmi, Betsy Carr, and Marin Campbell from the Honorable Jennifer McClellan's office joined over 60 civic and community leaders, board members, library staff, friends, and foundation board members for breakfast. Jen Duell and Maya Smart moved on to Book Babies and Toddler Time here at Maine yesterday, and Maya was interviewed in our team space by Mike, Mike King with Radio One. Later that evening, we had 44 donors join us for the donor reception, and roughly 150 member, community members for the evening session from 7 to 8 p.m., including Michael Paul Williams, whose November editorial sparked the idea for yesterday's event. Comments that we heard were positive and recognized the library is a place for this type of conversation and effort. I wanna quickly share an excerpt of a comment shared uh, with a board member this morning by one of the evening's attendees. I'm so glad I went. I invited our grandson's mother and hoped she would go, which she did. 
She said she really enjoyed it and learned a lot. I can get overwhelmed sometimes thinking about all the problems in the world and whether we are making a difference. I remind myself of the starfish story, which I'll have to share with you sometime. I was really encouraged. There was an event last night for people who wanted to learn more about giving their kids the best chance at life. I could feel the goodness in the room. Any other comments um, or suggestions, please don't hesitate to share those with either Scott or I, and we'll be following up um, as appropriate. Uh, Scott will, in just a moment, share with you the call to conversation document, which was shared with breakfast and donor reception attendees, and we can talk about that. Related to grant activity and partnership updates, we want to thank Virginia Credit Union, Town Bank Foundation, and the Friends, all of whom supported uh, the Maya Smart event. Grants have been submitted to the Allen and Margot Blank Foundation in support of the Gelman Room Concert Series 50th season this fall, and to both the George and Effie Say Foundation and Richard and Carolyn Guathme Memorial Trust in support of early childhood learning programs here at the library. Grant submissions are currently in development to the REB Foundation, Dominion Energy Charitable Foundation, and the Universal Leaf Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Any questions for Susan? Okay. Um, sure. I think we need to applaud Susan, Jennifer, and Sue, the team, because they worked relentlessly on an event that was at a larger scale than I believe we've done since I've been on the board, and they need all the kudos we can possibly give them. So can we give them a round of applause? I'd like to quickly add that um, you can definitely see Chris's hand in that <laughs> entire event. And then she, she was alarmed when I said that earlier, I think, to her. But the um, you can definitely see that the foundation worked very closely with the board and mm -hmm. the presence of Chris on this. And I think that went very well. And I think the materials that were produced on this were a level above what the foundation has done, what the library has done on its own in the past, the two together, really put together some, some nice materials that uh, you should have copies of somewhere, I'm sure. So uh, anyway, uh, right I think here. Chris also deserves a real round of applause. Okay. Um, Scott, why don't we turn things over to you okay. for the admin report? Well, I'm going to carry on and talk a little bit more about the Maya Smart event. Mm -hmm. um, this was a document that was handed out at our breakfast in the morning, and that was uh, just an amazing opportunity for us to bring the partners and uh, the people who are working with early litters, working directly with er, with small children and birth to five year olds together in a room, and hear just Maya Smart talk about her journey as a parent and why she wrote the book. And this book, I believe, is is one of the best ones I've read. I think in many years on on the concept of uh, helping your child to learn. Um, and as you said. Chris helped us kind of come to identify this as an issue. It was really uh, memorialized in our strategic plan. You'll remember that this is a key component, a goal in our strategic plan. It's been a goal of our organization for many years, but I believe the focus on it now is really been dialed in. Um, so what I'm excited about is that this, that catalyst that started when we did the strategic plan, when we came out of COVID, we're launching, um, launching an effort that the community needs because as we said, 60% uh, of the children showing up in kindergarten aren't ready. So we need to help parents and do our job as a library to help get those children ready for school. So that's what that day was about. It was just, it was so thoughtful and considerate the way it was designed. So we had the breakfast in the morning, then Maya Sharp Smart was able to come here and do a program for book babies and actually right. see it in action and connect with um, the with parents and children in the community. Yeah. And then we had that follow-up conversation in the evening. And I don't know that everybody knew that we, the, the foundation remembered to uh, send, to try and bring parents to the table. Um, 
part of our one of our strategies or curriculums that we do with early literacy and children is the basics. And in the basics, one of the key components for that to be successful is parent rental involvement. And so we sent a bus to each of the branches to pick anyone up who couldn't make it to the Virginia Museum of History and Culture so they could have an opportunity to attend. So I have to say, you're 100% correct. They thought of everything and we covered all of our bases. Um, and it is just a launch. Now the hard work begins. We have to keep going with what we started. And so I'm excited about that. I, I believe there are people in that room who heard it and they're ready to influence their neighbors and friends and community partners. And there were also foundation uh, representatives in the room and they were able to see our efforts that we're serious about this and we're gonna be a leader in it. And so that's what this document says to them. We distribute it to them. And so we're putting down a marker saying, this is what we're gonna do. And so I am grateful to you all to be supportive of it and get right beside us and make it happen. And so. remember, it was this board who voted unanimously <laughs> that this was God's priority and everything fell out from that. So, yeah, you, you guys are the ones who started it. Hmm. And I have to echo what Ben said. It was a fabulous day. It was. You know, and, uh, this is so critical. I haven't been in education all my life. I've seen children who are in middle school and never had a book in their home, you know, so there's no, there has not been a concerted effort toward, you know, being literate in, in many, too many homes. And, you know, it needs to start early. And, but the thing is, a lot of parents don't know where to start, don't know what to do. Right. And one thing about Maya's book, it is, straight talk it's, it's not lofty you know research above you know the average person they simple strategies that people can do and it's nothing you know that you have to go out of your way really to do and this library can support everything that's in her book so I have to, you know that it was a perfect choice it really was and that's our roadmap toward early literacy I, I'll comment that um, I thought the mix of uh, organizations that were there yesterday morning it was just phenomenal. That you really had a lot of people there who will take this back to the community. And the one one concern I, I have always with these kind of things is to discuss. They were preaching to the choir a little bit, uh, which is always, you know, that you have that. But how do we make sure it's getting out there to the community? And I think that that mix of people will help get it out there. You know, I'd love to see other things and, and I had some ideas, Chris, you and I can talk about later, but how you maybe get that book in the hands of, of others who aren't coming to library functions, aren't going to some of those things, but do have other community things. Um, it is very, just skimming it, it's a very straightforward book. And if we could get it out to more people, I think that would, would be helpful. But the the group that you, you guys lined up, Susan and your team, really was just, um, it, it was almost intimidating. Uh, you had so many people there who were just real community organizers and workers and who had dedicated many years of their lives to uh, to literacy at different stages of uh, of that. So a great, great event in that respect. Um, did you want to also talk about the, as Susan said, the engagement form now or is that later? Um, that would be, that was this document. Um, is that the document she's you were referring yeah. to? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure whether there was whether you were talking about the well, um the sheet, the, the the simple the real engagement sign up um the card that uh the channel lent me a, a pen for yesterday. And I said I was gonna work on it later. But <laughs> and I didn't bring one with me today. Um but there was also a sheet handed out that I thought was very simple but useful and it's something that if it's not in the pack and I haven't gone through it, we might want to make sure that people know they can do that too, as far as- Was it the orange piece orange. of paper? Yeah, the orange, yeah, the orange sheet of paper. People had a real trouble with that. They did not find it simple. So, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so you must be smarter than- No, me. I, I <laughs> wouldn't say that. I think I'm probably just used to seeing forms. And <laughs> I, what I liked about it was it just said, okay, who are some people that you'd like to see included in this, reached yeah. out to in this. Yeah. And I think it's always nice when we do that, whether we're saying, okay, who can we reach out to and help the foundation uh, put a gentle touch for money? 
or whether we're saying, yeah. okay, how do yeah. you get people to to look at these things? Yeah. So, I mean, I that's what I liked about it. Yeah. And, and the concept, I don't know about the, uh, the form, how well it read, but the concept of if you weren't there and you didn't get one of the forms, um, one of the things I wanted to stress today is if you take a look at the book and Scott can probably come up with some copies of it if you weren't there, mm -hmm. um, take a look at the book, read it and say, okay, what organizations in my community or that I have contacts with could um, could take this and run with it and could you know get this out to their uh, their constituents, the people that, that they have contact with, and um, and I think you know if you can put down two or three of those each, it just broadens that base that we reach and help Chris's the the initiative that Chris is spearheading a spearheading a lot really get somewhere uh, as far as reaching those people who didn't come yesterday, so. Okay. Um, so, and then you're you wanna... coming out of the box and you have a couple of things in front of you, which is our three, two, one liftoff, which is an early childhood helping children get ready for school. So we're putting our money where our mouth is and we're taking action. So this is a program that'll happen this summer. And then you have our summer reading program, which will kick off early, which will kick off June 10th and go to August 6th. We have, uh, and that takes me to our hiring update. We have uh, positions advertised for uh, early learning interns. And so they are going to help us do more with that program. We need to do more programs, more activities, more story time. So they will be hired during the summer to help us do more. So and we've done funding for, uh, we're, we're squeezing funding from yeah, somewhere for so, two well, or more. I'll get into that. Okay. Our funding uh, opportunities from that the city is helping us with. Uh, I've got good news on that. Good. Um, so we have all those positions out. Uh, we're going to continue to seek those uh, those people to help us with this with this initiative. Um, and other hiring updates I have is we have uh, hired uh, uh, two new people at the main library, Christopher Slos and Hannah Kilgore. Uh, they're library technicians, and they've started um, at Broad Rock. We've uh, hired uh, Gina Ardente, Ardent. Uh, she started Monday. Um, and then at the main library, I am uh, bittersweet to report that Lynn Vandeness is going to retire. Lynn is an employee who has worked for the library for 50 years. Wow. So as we turn 100, we have an employee who's been here for half of those years. Um, we had a very nice reception for Lynn yesterday. Ben and his team put together uh, a recognition and just a chance for us to meet her family and uh, really uh, recognize her achievement. It is probably not anywhere close to what she's given us. Um, she is responsible for really carrying the Gelman Concert City series. Mm -hmm. That has been going on for, is it 47 years, almost 50 years? So she has carried on that concert series and that is a program that lets that enables musicians, we have a lot of talented musicians in this community to have concerts. Now, they may not be able to perform on the Altria stage or the Carpenter Center, but they can showcase themselves and share their uh, talents with the community and expose people to music that they may not be able to hear. Um, and that's been going on for 47 years. She also led the effort in the art, the art display. So the galleries that you see here, she helped figure out how to get the art hung on the walls in the Dooley foyer. Uh, she has been an integral connection to the art community in the city of Richmond. Um, and she's done it for over 50, about 50 years. And finally, First Fridays, that wasn't something that she has been to First Fridays for probably as long as First Fridays have been going on. I have no idea how long those have gone on, but I'm gonna tell you, Lynn is an employee who has given of herself to this institution. She has a public service, um, just attitude and awareness. And she is, is just, when you think of a public servant, that would be Lynn Vandenitz. Um, So she's given so much of herself to our library that. Just recognizing her yesterday was really nice. We're all very sad to see her go. So just want to share that with y'all. Did she do an oral history, Ben? She, <laughs> she's a little cagey. She's very humble. And she uh, is... Uh, and is she here today? So I was going to say, can she her. come down and... She takes Wednesdays off because she's worked every Saturday for the last... 50 years. Yeah. I, I don't know for how long, but she has worked Saturday. Wow. And she will probably be out in her garden today. She is a, uh, a very avid gardener. And uh, she is my 
really one of my helpful contacts with gardening. So I'm going to miss her for not only her art and music and all of the things that she's done, but her gardening tips. So very lovely person. If you have a chance, maybe reach out, send her a note. Yeah. Um, she would very much appreciate it. Her, her last day is a Delvin week. Oh, so, okay. Oh, this Saturday. Delvin Okay. And we have a lot going on Saturday. So we have Elvitra Belshis will be working with us. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Ben talk about Saturday. Right now? Um, hold on. I just, uh, so I'm going to let Ben talk about Saturday and he can fill you in on all the stuff we have going because this is National Library Week. So mm -hmm. we're having a big week. We not only had Maya yesterday, we had Library Workers Appreciation Day. We've had, uh, we've got events on Saturday. Um, so but back to uh, staff changes. So we say goodbye to Lynn and we say hello to Charlie Schmidt. Charlie is our new law librarian. And- uh, Oh, hello, I'll stand. I'm sure that everyone can meet me. Um, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll go sit down. And say, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> but I'm also, uh, I've, I've been an adjunct professor for over a decade at VCU. So I'm like, oh, this is like a classroom. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I will be brief. Uh, Scott and Ben asked me to come down and just introduce myself. I actually have a fairly long history with the library. Um, I was looking back, I first worked in Susan's position in 2006, then um, spent six years on the Friends, including five years as the president. Uh, I also subbed in for Meldon and the law library in 2013, that was 10 years ago. And I, I always, I'm staying connected to Richmond Public Library. And when Melvin transitioned over to Hull, the position came available and I thought it was an op just perfect opportunity. When I'd worked with Melvin before, we'd done a lot with the law library, the legal workshops, many rights workshops, a lot of outreach. Um, had bigger plans, but like with many things, the pandemic has you know, derailed that. And so getting back on track, but um, so I'm honored to be rejoining Richmond Public Library and um, transform not just the law library, um, but as we talked about uh, the business <clears throat> law and history section, what we are working on from the Tolman about Richmond Room. I don't want to, I want to do spoiler, but um, <laughs> it's, in it's in the strategic plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly. So um, rebranding the space is the Richmond Room, starting to do outreach, starting to just uh, get everything in a row, get organized and that sort of thing. My background is I'm, I'm not a librarian. I started out in nonprofit um, development, fundraising, um, nonprofit uh, sort of executive work, then decided to have a second career as a lawyer, went back to law school. And so I've been practicing um, in, uh, I've been in private practice and worked for um, public service and also the state um, as a lawyer for the last 10 years or so. And so um, I'm really excited to take the law library and the resources, the very unique resources to Richmond. So I don't know how much you'll know, but every jurisdiction has a law library, but it's most of the time in the courthouse and not very accessible to the public that you all know. So really building the, focusing the collections, making sure there's more remote access as with all things, you know, law, law libraries have uh, been transitioning from print to digital, making sure there's more access and also that we're stay focused on service. So again, you know, using connections we have and outreach to bring in experts, to bring in folks to continue to do the uh, legal workshops, many run workshop, take those out to the branches, a lot of ideas, but also building into the space itself in the Richmond room to look at um, having folks come in, having a landing pad for um, small business resources, nonprofit resources. My background also, Chloe, Ben, the rest of the staff to then get them connected to the next place. You know, we are the library. So I just in my first couple of weeks, it's been all kinds of questions from how do I find out more about advanced medical directives to um, I want to know more about the zoning process in the city of Richmond, right? And so starting there, getting them connected, saying, okay, next stop is the clerk's office, next stop is City Hall, next stop is this. Um, and it's just, it's really, um, it's, it's 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 really a privilege to be back and do that. So um, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks, We're really glad to have Charlie, and I'm excited 
at the direction we're going to go with the law library in that area of the building. We've got big plans from the strategic plan. Uniquely Richmond is going to launch from there. And so we're going to do more with it. So uh, we have a bright future there. Um, gosh, other things to celebrate. Um, I'm going to let the less rest of that report stand, and I'm going to turn it over to Clay for a brief report on North Avenue and where we're at with that, because the water damage from December is still being repaired. Hmm. So, what yes, uh, so long, Clay? <laughs> <laughs> the library. <laughs> oh, okay. So, as as uh, these things sometimes go, since there was an insurance claim involved and, and multiple city departments, it took took a bit of time to actually get, get uh, uh, work uh, uh, moving and contractors in place. Um, at, at this point, we uh, um, all the drywall work is complete. Uh, the painting related to that was done. We have new carpet uh, throughout about 85% of the, the building. The only carpet we, we didn't have to replace was in the workroom and in the meeting room. But we've got uh, a new, fresh design uh, um, in, in the carpet scheme. It looks really nice. Uh, we found out uh, just yesterday the city's going to come in and replace our all of our lights. Um, which if they're going to do it, now's the the time. So we're we're uh, glad about that because uh, um, they're older fixtures. So they'll a few of them will be changed just to LED, but the other Pictures will be uh, changed completely. Um, this morning they were uh, pulling out some old cabling and things, and they're going to do a little more touch up paint, I think, before it's over. But we're to the point now where we can uh, get some fixtures and furniture moved back in, and uh, we're going to kind of work around the, the existing, uh, the ongoing work with the lighting. But um, it looks like we're on track that we should be able to uh, be ready to open up before before June. So that's that's the the current plan. Can you think of anything else, Cheryl? That's we've got furniture ordered. We're waiting on it. It should be here by the uh, middle of the the month. And um, but yeah, everything's on track. <laughs> Finally, as hard as they can. Thank you. Any questions? So we are hoping to hit the May 15th target. That could still happen. It might be May 30th. So um, remember, we had extensive damage here. The water ran for about three days. I mean, literally, it was running out the doors. So um, that Christmas water situation hit a lot of folks. And so North Avenue took it pretty hard. I'm optimistic that once we're done with this, it'll look like a new location. There have been, been some improvements made. Yeah. Y'all yeah, yeah. were able to change some things. Yeah. We, had, we had a lot of loss. I mean, we lost about 4,200 books. Um, some furniture got damaged. So we've been adding books to the collection. Those new books will go back into the collection. We're backfilling and replacing, making sure that we're putting books back in the collection that are going to move. So we play with the sight line a little bit. We're trying to. Yeah. Okay. We're, trying, we're trying to make a couple changes in there to modernize it a little bit, improve like the light in there. It always seems a little dark in there. So uh, the light, extra lighting will help opening up pathways to the windows. There aren't a lot of windows in that building. And so the few windows we have, it'd be nice to have better sight lines to those. And uh, the carpet, the new carpet is gonna add a lot to the building. So uh, just takes time. Yeah. So I, we'll meet there soon after it opens. Yeah. yeah. One thing I would say, I, I had hoped when it happened uh, in what early January, we were over there looking at it, yeah. that we'd have it open for um, spring break for the schools. Uh, now it looks like we at least will make it before summer oh, reading yeah. program starts. Yeah. So, you know, when you look at it, it's it's not nearly as critical a week or two now, as long as we get it out there before those kids are out of school. And um, I think, you know, it it is, we're also fortunate that our libraries are very close together and that, um, yeah. It really is, what, a mile and a half to the next branch? I think the main library is the closest location here. Yeah. So Ben okay. has told me that we're seeing a lot of North Avenue patrons coming here to okay. the main library to use our services. So, uh, I was thinking of parts yeah. numbers look like they were up too, yeah. 
And I have one last thing to ask. Uh, Gail, would yeah. you please read that uh, proclamate or resolution from the Virginia General Assembly? Yes. Yeah. I know it's a lot of whereases, but it's not, I don't know that we've had a proclamation from the state. Uh, Senate Joint Resolution Number 380, whereas Richmond Public Library, an institution dedicated to increasing access to information and promoting literacy for the benefit of the residents of Richmond, celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2022. And whereas on November 16, 1922, the Richmond City Council passed an ordinance for a bond issue of $200,000 to support the creation of a public library for all. And whereas the first physical location of the Richmond Public Library opened on October 13, 1924 at 901 West Franklin Street with an inventory composed of family libraries and other collections that had been donated to the institution. And whereas in July, 1925, what would be named the Rosa D. Bowser Branch Library of the Richmond Public Library opened at the YWCA on North 7th Street to provide black Richmonders with access to books and other reading materials. And whereas what would become known as the main library of Richmond Public Library opened in 1930 at the corner of First Street and Franklin Street with the support of philanthropist Sally Mae Dooley, the site would then undergo a major expansion beginning in 1967 as, and was reopened to the public on September 15, 1972. And whereas Richmond Public Library extended its reach into the neighborhoods of Richmond through the development of new branches, including the Belmont branch in 1956, the Westover Hills branch in 1959, the Ginter Park branch in 1964, the East End branch in 1965, the Broad Rock branch in 1977, the West End branch in 1978, the North Avenue branch in 1983, and the Hull Street branch in 1987. And whereas Richmond Public Library has deployed innovative strategies over the years to improve its ability to serve the res residents of Richmond, including the use of bookmobiles and kiosks to make access to materials more convenient for patrons. And whereas the main library and eight branches of the Richmond Public Library underwent modernizing renovations between 2002 and 2017, enhancing the capacity for these locations to offer programs and classes, event space, free wireless internet access, public computers, and other services to support the residents of Richmond. And whereas with a new strategic plan in place that focuses on accessibility, early literacy, lifelong learning, and organizational strength, among other priorities, Richmond Public Library is poised to enjoy another century successfully serving the Richmond community. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate, the House of Delegates concurring, that the General Assembly here, hereby commend Richmond Public, Public Library on the occasion of its 100th anniversary, and be it resolved further that the Clerk of the Senate prepare a copy of this resolution for presentation to Richmond Public, Public Library as an expression of the General Assembly's admiration for the institution's history, and its contribu contributions to the Commonwealth. Susan Clark Shar, Clerk of the Senate. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> Lawyers. You're going to have to hear that. I'm the same kind of the drink and have that way through. Thank you, Gail. Yeah. Yep. Very nice. Anything else you wanted to? Uh... I think that's all of my report. Okay, let's um, go ahead and jump into. Um, Garrett's uh well, that's on, your report. You can give um you can, we, we can do that. I just yeah, I whatever you want to do. I was just going through the others before that, but we can. Okay, I ahead. was going to his advocates and now his Good. uh let, let's go ahead and finish the regular reports before we do the committee reports. So uh Garrett on the task force. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um first I just wanted to just talk briefly about the Maya Smart event. I loved it. The breakfast, the the evening program was phenomenal. I invited two of my neighbors to come down. They absolutely enjoyed it. Uh, they purchased the book. They were like, this is amazing. Um, so I just want to thank again everybody that's a part of that. 
I remember talking to Chris last night and I was I was, I was like, Chris, your hands are all over this in my brain. But, <laughs> but I thought it was just absolutely amazing. So I just wanted to say that. And I really love what Maya Smart said mm -hmm. as it related to the, the actual laundry literacy centers. Mm -hmm. That was something that was so out of the box and so my, my thing. So something that I will keep in mind for the future. Um, as it relates to advocacy, I know we're going to talk about this more uh, when we get to the finance committee report, but things are shaping up to look really good for us. Uh, again, thank you to uh, Mayor Tony's administration for what they propose in this upcoming year's budget. And I know the work the city council is currently working through is great. Um, but as we always talk about, there's so much more work to be done. Uh, it just doesn't stop there. We still have more opportunities that we can capitalize on. So we should, should do that through our advocacy and the emails and communications that we're uh, sending to our city council representatives, but also making sure that we're getting contacts over to our school representatives as well. So I want to thank all of you for being able to send out the communication that we circulated right after our last uh, meeting. Um, I know a few of you did get responses and people are, are preparing to, to get their city council or their school representatives down to their localized libraries. And we can get some of those photos and we can add into some of our uh, upcoming uh, communications as well. And I'll talk to Jonathan Young and Crystal Larson and Shonda Harris Muhammad. So I'm getting them down there very, very uh, soon, uh, which is going to be great. Um, but as I said before, we want to make sure we continue the communication. So one, uh, you'll be receiving a communication uh, from Gianna later this week. I will be including these in that communication. I think these are great for our city council representatives and our school rep representatives to include in their uh, digital communications. Exactly. Um, because we really want to make sure that we are, again, as we said a little bit earlier, getting this information to them so they can disperse that to the community at large. Um, so we can make sure that these programs are utilized and people can take advantage of them as much as possible. Um, but I also want to take the opportunity through that best communication to educate them on the great program that happened last night. I mean, I know we we really wanted to, you know, some were planning to come, but they couldn't make it uh, on city council and school board. But this is amazing information, so much wealth of knowledge they can be able to spread to the community. Um, so we want to make sure that we give them the high level like Maya did yesterday um, and then invite them uh, to check out the book and get that information to uh, their community members. I think um, there was one uh, RPS person, uh, I think she was in the third grade, I think she taught, she spoke towards the end of, of, of Maya's um, evening program. And she just talked about, you know, how she thinks this book could be very much so utilized by her department chairs and how they can be able to incorporate that into their next school year curriculum. So, you know, that was a great example of how getting that information out can impact people and be able to be utilized for our, for our kids. Excellent. Anything you wanted to bring up specifically about advocacy that we need to do, you'll be, we're seeing that just so, follow what, what comes out of that from uh, Gianna, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So if we, if you don't see something by early next week, at least uh, ping Gianna and ask her. So. Um, Chris, you uh, have a spot for an update? Um, I will you... just tell you some of the things that are, are coming up. We're going to be having a meeting uh, the week of May 8th to talk about evaluation criteria for the new and expanding programs we're doing. If we don't start measuring now before we start these programs, we lose the opportunity of learning what we could do better or for those of us who love to get money for the library, giving them actual data as to how effective we are. And it's not something we usually do, but I think if we wrap that into this initiative, we'll improve, which is what we always want, but we'll also be able to be much more professional when we reach out to foundations and individuals with actual inf you know, quantitative information on how we're doing. And that elevates our professionalism and our earnestness. I think I'm an earnest person. I think everybody, I'm delusional, loves an earnest person. <laughs> oh, so we want to be, you know, just trying hard. So that's really our next step in planning, evaluating, plan some more. And we I have no no doubt the library will execute in one so well. Fun. Okay, thank you. Um okay, I don't have much of a chair report uh, today. Um I think it, most of what I would like to touch on has already been covered. Uh just how successful all of these programs are. I think um 
that the things are moving along very smoothly. First thing I would like to do, though, is recognize our exalted uh, uh, lawyer who, I guess, uh, our counsel, maybe is the way to put it, Laura, who is going to be leaving us. I'm sure you all saw, I think Scott sent something out about that, that uh, Laura's been chosen as the new city attorney. Um, so she's- uh, We'll miss you. We will. Oh, don't let me cry. I love this board. <laughs> And Laura's been very patient with this board over the years. So <laughs> I have to give her a lot of credit there and has worked through, uh, I think, helping a lot of us understanding, under, helping a lot of us understand the process of the city and having patience with things. I think Gail and I were talking the other day about the Cersei uh, part catalog update and how long it took to get contracts on that. And um, we're talking, I said, but you know, Laura just stayed with it. And kept us on that and eventually got the contracts um, approved despite issues that uh, that existed with some of her management on that. So um, we really are sorry to lose you, Laura, but we are thrilled that you're going to be at a higher spot in the city and uh, reachable for us. Um, I hope <laughs> as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, and here's just a little something for you um, to recognize you for all your years of service with us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Um, so I, I, I represented, I'll just, can I just say a few things? Please. I, please. I um, represented the board and the libraries for 17 years. Um, and it's, I mean, I, th I think it was my very first day at the city and it's just, I, I just love this board because it's not, you. I mean, y'all don't do it for politics. Um, you don't do it for money. You don't do it. Certainly don't do it for money. You don't do it for any benefit to yourselves. You do it because you believe in the libraries and you believe in the benefit to the community. And and so, I mean, for whatever small part I had, which really I think I was just a witness to it. It's um, <laughs> it's it was good for the soul. So I'm such a crier. Um, <laughs> so I just I, I'm going to miss you all, but um, I'm not leaving. I mean, I'm at the city attorney's office still. So call me. I will help. I will. You know, now you have a contact over there and Shannon is going to take good care of you all and keep you out of trouble with uh, FOIA. And I should One have your hardest I, job. Dan. I should have told Shannon because because we had some discussion about the law library that for 17 years, I've heard about the law library. So <laughs> it's good because you delivered on your last so day. You it on my last day. So um, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. It's been thank, fun. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. Could you uh, go ahead and introduce Shannon to us? Yeah. So, oh, thank you. So Shannon Fitzgerald has been with our office for a year, two years. Um, and she is in the litigation division, which is what, what, that was my division. So I picked her and I'm excited for her because she gets to now witness all the goodness you all do. I told her it's not a super hard board, um, at all, really. We plan to keep it there. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and it's going to be great. And wait till you see the main library renovations. That's always, it's just, oh, and one more thing. Um, so when I, I just have to tell you all that when I was interviewed for the position, I talked a lot about the library board <laughs> and told council how great this board was. Oh, and thank you. Asked them if they had seen the renovation plans for the main library, and they all had, and they loved it. And so I just, you know, so you had, you know, you yeah. got me as an advocate. So call me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And. Dan, and we are happy to, to have you stepping in. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that you came from litigation. We really hope that you won't need any litigation skills with us. They also but, um, <laughs> but it's good to know that they're there. So thank, thank you. you so and much. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. And as, as Laura said, the biggest thing sometimes with us is, is either getting contracts worked through or keeping us from getting in trouble on FOIA and um, open meeting rules and things. But Laura's gotten us a little bit under control. So, oh, she's kept us under control. Oh. Yeah. yeah, we we still have those issues of not replying all occasionally and and things like that. But we we've made progress, and um, and she's been patient, uh, at least particularly with me as I figured out how to do some of this. So thank you. Um, I'd like to mention a couple of other things. Um, 
I don't know how much everyone spends on the board packet, how much time. There's a lot that's there, and um, it often looks like it's sort of the same stuff. So um, I'm not suggesting you're not spending enough time or you should spend more time. I'm just saying that I always look at it and look for some things in there say, okay, well, how are we doing on some of the metrics? And I just uh, want to compliment Scott and his team that we have really recovered well from COVID. If you look at the numbers, some of them are off a little bit from a year ago, some are up a little bit from a year ago. Um, but overall, the branches are doing very well on door counts, on circulation, um, on the programs are getting back to a, a nice level. Um, I was really impressed with how much e-content grew between last year and this year, which is really surprising because you would have figured that the big bump in e-content was in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and as we came out of it, I sort of thought, well, that will taper off and we'll see as the uh, true or the, the book circulation went up, you think you'd see the, uh, the e-content went down. And it isn't. It's just a, a nice um, aggregate, you know, bump to it. So overall, we're seeing a lot more use in the library. E-content this past year went up as much as having one more branch, in my mind. So I mean, it's it's when you think about that with with that, it's a big big increase. Um, Law library. I will mention Laura since you're still here today. I, I, I'm a little confused by it in the finance report, and <laughs> if y'all are. Two, um, great, it may just be my- 17 um, years. <laughs> it, the, the issue that we get, just to let Shannon know, Absolutely. is whether we're getting the funds from there, which comes from, I know, from the case, the fee on the cases in uh, circuit court, I guess, or circuit, uh, circuit uh, general, general district. district. Okay. Um, but that the, uh, there's always a bit of a lag. Um, I was just trying to figure out the, when I looked at the funding that we've seen on that page, on my glasses because I'm like to... page 20. Page 20. Thank you. Yeah. So on the law library, um, what was it that sort of confused me there? The the fact that we're showing a negative four hundred and fifteen thousand on the unobligated. I just I I was just a little confused. We showed a negative two fifty six on rollover. Um and year to date of 159. I'm just, are we straight with the way it's being accounted for? And where are we on that, really? I mean, it's just, it's a it's a big number to see there in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and those are like catch ups from previous years. So the deficit there is from previous years. Right. And I can't explain how that deficit started and where it's right. at. I know. I can say that the expenses continued to grow for a long time. Yes. And one thing that we've done recently is reduce the number of actual physical items that we were doing. Oh, yeah. We're we're having to uh buy so we signed contracts last year uh for print items. Mm -hmm. And we could not get out of those when we discovered that we were one of the few institutions that was still getting print legal books. Um, Westlaw informed us that I believe we were like one of two that were still getting them. And the print stuff is now astronomically expensive compared to electronic. So that's one of the things that Charlie, Ben and I did when Charlie got here about 10 minutes after he was here and said, hey, do we still need to get all this print stuff? And we determined that no, we do not. It is not helping us and it is not necessary. So eliminating that will eliminate a very large amount of monthly expense from the law library, upwards while, of while upwards it. of about ten thousand dollars a month. Okay. And while doing it, it increases the online access to yes. Westlaw publications and and so on. So we're, so we actually have more. I mean, we haven't lost anything by getting rid of it. We've no, we'll have much. It, it's it's actually the electronic information, legal information, is so much stronger than the. Uh, and accurate yeah. than the print stuff. Right. We we don't have to put pocket parts in. We don't have to chase yeah. codes and regulations and keep those updated, which mm -hmm. were a constant job. That all is done. And the other thing that we're working on is expanding the Westlaw access beyond this location. Like it may be possible for uh, library users to visit a branch library and get on Westlaw. 
So somebody in the East End or the West End or anywhere in the system could get access yes. to Westlaw to do legal research if they need to do it. So that would be helpful to a citizen who is trying to represent themselves or a law firm who is trying to get access to something that maybe they don't have access to. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what this uh, this is for. So what? have I have I hit it? Okay. Okay. And ju just to, to clarify, I had no no concerns about where we're headed with that from the changes that we've made to the structure of it, the movement of the law library. Mm -hmm. I'm very much in favor of making it more accessible. I'm just concerned that we're, do we have anything that's gonna come around as we look at this and say, we've got good budget news as Garrett mentioned, mm -hmm. are we going to at some point say, oh, well, we've got to suddenly take 400 or 500,000 out of our budget that we hadn't planned to. And in the years past, city always, just says, oh, yeah, well, okay, well, we'll write that off or whatever. But it's, okay. it just bothers me. And you have to attach to this deficit. I can't speak for the yeah. finance department or the budget department right. in terms of how that is, is okay. processed. Do we know what's actually coming in, I guess, to them so uh, that our budget is. Yes, yeah, so we've, of... we've reached out to the courts. We know that they're they're giving their contribution to the city, that it's electronically being transmitted over. Um, okay. We know that we're receiving the funds. So, um, <laughs> Okay, that's pretty much where we're at. So in, okay. uh, we'll continue to work with the finance department and the budget department right. to solve this problem. Um, so, okay, hopefully we'll have a solution. Although I, the, the problem goes back before anyone on this board. Prior to us. I think um, we'll continue we're all, we're all dead and gone too. And it's, yeah, it's just uh, <laughs> I, I keep having hope that we'll eventually resolve it and have a clean slate going forward. But anyway, um, I think those were the main things I wanted to touch on. Um, like I said, we've already talked about how well the uh, the whole early childhood initiative is going. I thought it was interesting how Maya really one one thing I will say, and I think Chris is covering it in her team. Maya pushed very heavily on not just the uh, up to third grade to literacy, you know, the, the learning to read up to third and reading to learn after third, um, and not just the preschool initiative side, and uh, which is you hear a lot about the preschool initiatives, and I mean it's it's a very politically uh, popular uh, type of thing. She really did a beautiful job, I thought, of the you know birth to 18 baby, months, yeah, maybe? Uh, baby to two. Yeah, yeah. to two years. Yeah, yeah she really yeah. did that nicely. Yeah. And it's a reminder, and that's one that we need to think about how we can support yeah, those I, parents. I agree um, completely, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. it really is. I mean, it's just so important. And that's also, as she said, when you pick up, because of that, some of the other issues that may be there with kids in time to address them. So um, anyway, I think everything's going great on all of that. Um, Let's see, Garrett, did you have anything else on the finance that you wanted to cover from finance report or your okay. uh, only thing I can report is that uh, I think council is still working through amendments and they haven't finalized a budget yet. I think they're close. No, they introduced it on Monday and I think that the next meeting is May 8th and that's when it will be adopted. Is there another public hearing or anything? Yeah. We're finished. We're finished. Yeah. And we didn't have any surprise cuts that slid in on no. us in there, anything that we know of. I don't, I don't know. You're not aware of it. Yeah. So. Like, uh, you're watching yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I didn't hear of anything. They have to finish by beginning of May so they can sign the teacher contract. They're pretty finished. And they're so finished. They, they, okay. they were, I thought they were all over but the shouting two weeks ago. Um, so I, I was Excellent. there on Monday to make sure that nothing changed. Um, and I didn't see anything change. So okay. we should be on track. We'll know for sure when we can start sending our thank you notes and our reminders to everybody because that's the really important thing is to thank these folks who stepped up and gave us approximately $1.5 million more this year than last year. So that is a significant increase for us and is going to allow us to do some things that we were trying to do before the pandemic and we can continue to do now. Um, you can truly say we've gotten back to where we were before the pandemic. Funded, yes, and which we will it's taken this long, but right. And it's they heard what we asked for. We need more. We need more access, more hours, more programs, um, and they're responding. So thanking them is the next thing, and then reminding them that we need more <laughs> um, next uh, year. 
We're just and like your. We remind them every day. Yeah. We need more. And, 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 well, and this is the same. No, we, we constantly right. remind them. Right. right. We need more. And we're doing all of these other things. And we're helping solve community, helping with community issues and providing information. So, um, Janet, do you or Cheryl have anything? Uh, you from the committee and Cheryl from knowing the building? I have been thinking about facilities. Would you like to hear what I've been thinking? Please. <laughs> a few months ago, I think it was Bill said at a meeting that our branches, or he might have mentioned a particular branch, was too small. I probably did. And, and he used harsh words. So I've been thinking about, um, apparently it's time to talk about branches again. I know you feel like you just... Well, we might as well, because uh, that was the next part of the right. 2009 master plan. Right. Said, and Gail can uh, chime in. Uh, so, we needed to do a master plan for the main library. So, That's complete. Well, yes. I've been thinking about how we approach the branch situation. And maybe you can tell me how you did it. And was it 08 or 09 that you did that? So... We, as a board working with the staff, need to say, here's what we say a branch should have. Um, and we should work on that list because we, we want them to have adequate meeting rooms. We want study rooms. We want collection space. But we also want activity space. Yeah. We want great story time space. So I feel like we should work on making a statement, here's what a Richmond Public Library branch should be able to offer to the public. And I don't know if that already exists from the last time. Gail, do you remember? In, Did, in the master plan? It's interesting you say this because I had a, an idea. They're building a uh, new apartment building at Grove and Thompson. <coughs> What if we approach them about putting 5,000 square feet as a branch to replace Belmont? Yeah. And Belmont's our biggest issue. Right, I mean, right. Space. Belmont's the biggest. That's yeah. why I was thinking of that. And, and that's good, but I think we should be prepared to say, here's what a branch should have. Yeah, we do you know that. And I think in the 2008 plan, it had general needs. They had a different approach in 2008, the architects, then about Kind of identifying a type of library for they were trying to say this is a tech library where right. people go for the internet or this is a kids library and i think we've we've found that really that. Okay. all the branches kind of need everything yeah but but so we so that was a little different approach but i think generally tech is one meeting space programming well tech is so well integrated now it's come to be assumed you can plug this in here you can flip the switch and do that and it's not like we talk about it so much like a separate thing i i think but for when i say tech um access to the internet for people who don't have wi-fi at home mm -hmm. so so 2008 was 15 years ago mm -hmm. and in 2008 some of us had MySpace pages. <laughs> so many things have changed since 2008 with that master plan. So we had modems for crying out loud. We some <laughs> still had the AOL CD-ROM that they would get in their mailbox, uh, get their email account. Um, yes, it, the next thing to do would be a master plan for the branch libraries and going and assessing the branch libraries and saying, okay, based on the neighborhoods around this library branch, this is what we need. We know for sure that all of our branches need study rooms and larger meeting rooms mm -hmm. and, and story space, story, and time. story time space. Absolutely. <clears throat> if we're committed to early learning and literacy, we are going to need spaces to welcome uh, neighborhood families so that we can have space to do the wonderful activities that we saw Maya do upstairs, you know, book babies. And we had this amazing community partner come in and did art for babies. And it was a community partner. She's, they've been to Westover Hills. They're working at the main library. And it was difficult for our staff to work in that space because they had to have the, the little, the, the babies. I mean, we're talking three-year-olds uh, in the story time space. 
and we didn't want to move them to another space and we didn't have enough room for them. So we had to just kind of on the fly figure it out and bring some of the other babies into the program, which was great, but that's hard for our staff. And it, it's also showing our families that we're not really thinking of their needs. Yeah. So they're telling us what they want we have to be able to start responding. We can't do it in some of our spaces. So a master plan will point these details out and identify problems, identify opportunities, and let us move forward. That's what we did with the main library master plan. And it's now in the city's hands. Again, the cities own our buildings. So they are the ones who we need to make the case with. This is what we need and it's important. And you all do that with your advocacy. And so when we're doing all of this stuff, it's just, it's reminding everyone what we do, how we do it, and what we need. So uh, a master plan is the next step. We need to figure out when we can begin it. So uh, let's start. I'm ready today. Okay. <laughs> uh, we will add it to the list. With Canada, I'm going to suggest yeah. we go maybe a little more than just adding it to the list in the master plan. I think we need the master plan on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to quickly do exactly what you said as to the, here's the minimum that we need in each branch. Okay, meeting rooms of at least and able we, to, we need to be and handle this capacity, et cetera. Hmm? We need to be pushy. We can't be told, oh, well, this we building's do. only this big. Right. And we need to say, so, and you're going to fix it. Right. How? Exactly. So, what I was going to suggest is that, you know, one of the concerns we heard about the uh, mass plan for here was the process it took so long with. And not Laura's fault, but with the <laughs> bid going out uh, for the the uh, proposal there and language having to be added and going back out after the responses came in the first time and all of that. And then a somewhat less responsive um, uh, contract award winner than, than some of us might have liked as far as how long they took to do things and their cleaning up that we got a little later possibly in asking for the money in the capital budget this year. Um, we were on we we're on time with the schedule as far as getting it in there before December. But if we'd gotten in there six months earlier, we'd have had six more months of people thinking about it and it would have been beneficial. Um, if we start looking at the branches on a master plan, there's no way that we're going to get any request for capital in in the upcoming capital budget, my gut. I just don't see it happening in the next um, seven to eight months. And we can... Just the process, if we have to bring in anyone to do that, I think we need to put it together internally, no external contractor on it, we need to get the basics on there. And then I think we need to say, here's what we want for everyone, but we need to target. And I think Gail has hit it very strongly on Belmont's what we need to target right now. It's our least uh, capable branch. It's in a growing area of the city. Um, it serves multiple districts because it, it picks up, uh, what is the fifth that has no library? What? Well, the second has, second. Our, ours doesn't, second, doesn't second, have second, no second that has no library. The fifth second and fifth. Yeah. Second. yeah. Okay, so it, it really you know is important there. And as you said, they're getting ready to build that building. Um, we've got additional buildings going on at Scott's Edition mm -hmm. and there's some possibilities there. And as uh, Fred's not here today, but there's another opportunity uh, right on the boulevard, almost at Grove also that there may be an ability to say, let's move that library, build one completely. So we're not trying to renovate, we're not having the library shut down and so on, and then sell that branch. So I think we we should try to look at that as something that we put a proposal together for the city quickly, not looking at each of the nine branches um, in detail for this. I know Scott doesn't like that approach and that's okay. Um, I just think, like I said, we should go ahead and, and y'all can disagree with me on that. I think that we can start on the master plan idea, but if we take the time to look at all the branches and analyze them completely, we're going to be 2025 budget before we are 2026 budget before we get there. But, but I think Janet's point no, I about think Janet, yeah, coming I think up right. with general standards for all the branches. Absolutely. Like, not square footing each branch. Well, that's what I'm saying. Let's, no, let's they, not they ask for anything. They must be a minimum of 5,000 square feet. Yeah. They must all have tutoring rooms. They must all... Right. Just, yeah, no. And quickly from that, and say Belmont's the first say, one we want to approach. Yeah, but but and, starting point. Oh, yeah, I agree. That's yeah. why I said let's yeah. get that yeah. minimum to the basics of what but we want many to get. Other, what's the square footage of Belmont? 
Cheryl, what's that? Four thousand. Four thousand. Forty some hundred. Square footage of Belmont is it about four thousand? Uh, that was it's, it's uh, more than that. But that that was the, the thing smoking. Heard me say this before. That was the sad part is when Belmont opened, it was too small to own. Uh, they wanted. Yeah. 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 So. Five thousand square feet there. And and that addition didn't belong to it just open up to sixty five. But so when the planning for Westover Hills came in, they were going to make it a ten thousand square foot building after the brain for council and, and everything. They, and by the way, it's shown you uh, council we were the most most uh, uh, expenditure for the library for Westover Hills residents. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. we end up after they they wanted to build a, a ten thousand square foot. Uh, building for one hundred thirty thousand dollars, we ended up with barely five thousand square feet. <laughs> yeah, and uh, around the house uh, now, and we're uh, opening up to fifty nine. But yeah, that's something that's been been known all this time that the city's never really been able to wipe that square foot square foot of depth. It it, ha it has issues at Belmont of space. Um, you can go up, but you can't really go out. You that's can't fix parking. You go up, you lose a lot in um, getting from floor to floor um, as a high cost associated, et cetera, which is why, once again, I really would love to get behind Janet's idea here that we, we get an overall plan there. And then we look at that because I think there are two or three targets of opportunity that make replacing right. Belmont now. And I'm going to add that won't be here in three years, <laughs> honestly. When we look at models, in other library systems mm -hmm. it is not uncommon and of course we ha every library system has their own deal where a developer says give me your little teeny library in this wonderful amazing space and i'll build you a much bigger right. library that's a little you know out of yeah. the these kinds of horse trades uh might be reasonable tools Given, you know, every yeah. city has their own rules, uh, it, it'll, and, and Scott's a deal maker, you're a deal maker, you know, just to kind of, yeah, exactly. so, so I think Gail and you both have, uh, if there's more tools we can put making a deal mm -hmm. with a developer and, you know, we won't give you your approvals unless you do the, or you know, whatever you can do in an Italian accent would be. <laughs> <laughs> well, Richmond is growing so fast, you know, and it takes so long to get anything done. I'm thinking in the future, we need to start looking at alternatives to branches because there's not going to be, a, well, one thing, we're not going to be able to afford the, the land <laughs> purchased, you know, to build one. But I'm looking, I'm thinking areas like you know the growth in Scott's Edition, the growth of Jeff Davis Highway, oh, yeah. and their access to libraries. You know, I mean that mm -hmm. nobody can walk to a library from yeah. you know those yeah. places. So we need to start looking at where can we get some facility. You know, under our <laughs> purview, we make that part of Janet's job. Okay, you know, I, I mean, yeah, and and with the driving around looking for places. <laughs> Absolutely. And with the efforts to, you know, go right. green Parker's and not have people yes. driving around yes. Richmond, you know, we need to push the, that the libraries are places, right. you know, right. they, they should be available to all neighborhoods yeah. and, and accessible, you know, walking distance or whatever, right. you know, to go along with the go green movement. And some of that can be, you know, we've talked about a bookmobile uh, again, you know, going going back to the 60s a little bit, but um that there's, there's some benefit, particularly Jeff Davis, that yeah. could fit in well with. Um, I mean, as far as Scott's edition, my first thought on that would be, well, we need to replace Belmont, and and it would help with that. I can't believe we can't find a developer in Scott's edition who would say, I'll give you 2,000 feet or 1,500 yeah. feet, and you do it as a you know very limited branch library with evening hours only for you know X and so on, and you know have sort of mini branches in some of these mm -hmm. um, because that is, I mean, the people, you do see people walking from Scott's Edition over to Belmont, but um, Well, and every time not, you see an apartment you know. building with a storefront on the bottom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Pop up. And you look Where at one on Broad right now, not at Scott's Edition, but near Scott's Edition. Uh, I mean, 
They're not filling those up yet. <laughs> Where the dairy ben, ben was. Ben raised his hand. Mm -hmm. They're putting a huge building they are. there. Yes. So they're scaring going up a lot. Them. They're going. Yeah, <laughs> ben, 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 ben wants to say something. Not scared. Not scared of the future. Um, part of the RPL 100 story that we are telling this year is about how the libraries were prioritized and planned and promised and you know then at some point delivered and um i'm i'm truly not waiting into a debate one side or the other but just simply objectively as clay pointed out um you know the, the first investment in a focus built library was belmont right and the second was westover hills right and this was 10 years after a updated Bowser Branch was promised that you know didn't come to fruition. Um, and then when the East End branch finally opened after Country Park in 64, 65, the library in Jackson Ward, Bowser Branch was closed. But as many people who so a few people who came to the RPL 100 um, history talk at um, Broad Rock um, spoke about like. They were like, well, why did they close the Bowser branch when they opened the East End branch? Those branches aren't near each other. You know, it's not, it's not like, oh, well, they're down the street from each other. They're across the valley from each other. So um, I don't disagree. Obviously, it's objectively true that Belmont needs, you know, something needs to happen, but uh, just you might want to be mindful of, you know, history and the narratives that are out there about our institution. Ben, ben is right that there's a lot to consider. For instance, when uh, some of our volunteers spoke up about relocating the main library, mm -hmm. my first thought is the second and the fifth district do not have branches, and this is the closest to those. So it makes sense to, right. to have um, the main library here, um, it, plus the other responsibilities that Maine has that the branches do not have that require space. So nothing is going to be perfect, but it yeah. just seems like with all this growth in uh, apartments and condos and, and businesses that there might be an opportunity for a public-private partnership. Well, and this is why we should do a master plan. So we're circling back to the beginning of the discussion. We need a master plan with the guiding principles of what is it, the expectations, core expectations right. of our branch location. Right. Right. And then we need to also get into the specifics of what we need throughout the city. I wouldn't want to do a uh, any plan that would just single out one library over another. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say that Belmont needs or Hall Street needs mm -hmm. any. So yeah. I would advise that we do it for all places. That uh, makes sense. And be equitable and uh, considerate of all places because mm -hmm. all of them, all of them need to be addressed. All of them are undersized. All of them have unique community needs. The last master plan was 15 years ago. Again, my space exists. It doesn't exist anymore. So the ideas and concepts that were presented were good ones at the time, and they served us well. They need to be updated, and we need to do it for every location. I don't want to leave anybody out. And I would kind of ask that we look at demographic information for the city to see what the needs are for particular uh, communities. So for instance, you know, the Jeff Davis and his Hispanic community. Scott's edition is more, I guess, uh, singles, not not particularly families, yeah. but you know they might uh, need more meeting spaces. You know, so you know, look at the the demographic kind of stuff right. before we make some uniform decisions. Well, and we have that information. The city has developed the Richmond Three Hundred, and that's a comprehensive plan that says where the city intends to go. Mm -hmm. So now we have that advantage that we didn't have in 2008 of that information and those kind of uh, ideas about where the city could go. And we can align with that and be in step with where the CIP process is going and the planning department is going. We have to be, we have to stay in those lanes for us to ha even have a shot at getting the funding right. because the city owns these buildings yep. uh, to, to, to do it. Okay. Yeah. So you'll, Sort of start that process. We'll have a facilities on that committee meeting. Committee. He will pursue this idea. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Emily, anything on governance that you want to? No update. updates from governance. Okay. 
Um, Scott, I don't have any unfinished business to you. I don't. You don't. Okay. And I don't have any new business. So I'm going to uh, accept a, a solicit a motion to adjourn from somebody. Oh, yeah, I have one oh. business for oh, look at the West End yeah. land. There's something yeah. going on with the juvenile program over there. I don't know. Is it, is it a number of uh, things paid 14? Been a lot of construction around street work and stuff like Not that. Sure. So maybe people have been reluctant to leave Every time they go that way, there's some sort of bottleneck or detours and things. Juveniles. Circulation is no, the um, programs in okay, March, uh, it was yeah. right in March, it was way, way off for some reason. They usually have a lot of young folks in there. No, so I know that we have a lot of uh, we do more young adult programs here than we do at anywhere else, so right, it just could have been a month where we just didn't have as, as many programs. Yeah, I mean, it I, dropped I, from 162 to 11. <laughs> yeah, I sort of wondered whether, uh, when you look at the uh, the prior month with the uh, the attendance of it at one sixty two, as you said, going down to eleven, whether some of this was Easter yeah. break, um, for any of these, you know, that particular one serves a lot of the uh, parochial and private schools in the West End as well as the uh, Mary Montford and Albert Hill found yeah. and so on, and all of them because of the way Easter fell this year, might have shown up in our March attendance if people were away during those yeah. times. So they may have been putting on events when <laughs> nobody, I don't know. I wondered about that too, though. It could just be an error. It could be it could a be just a strange yeah. drop, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, particularly when you look at the number of programs, you say you don't even have two per program. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we'll check. I, I, I think that's just a, I think that's a clerical error. It's an error, okay. But I'll, I'll look into it. They've been redoing sidewalks around. It, they have, just for a big old mess. The people still going yeah. in and borrowing when you books see a and drop doing like things. That, it's and, usually... and I okay. also wanted to say thank you for putting all this information about the cameras in there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> quite a bit of stuff. <laughs> but I think people need to know if they're being watched. Yeah. Uh, they need to have access to the legal aspects of you know, book banning on the rise. Yeah, we have to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Sharon, anything else you had? No. Okay, let's uh, somebody make a motion to uh, adjourn. I move to adjourn. Okay, Janet, second. I second it. Gail, all in favor, aye. Okay, aye. we are adjourned. Thank